you know, world GDP is about $70 trillion. Like it's, and the notional outstanding is even more than that. Like it's serious sums of money that are kicking around then. And it's, I suppose, hard to put your head around just how much money is actually involved. Um, you know, trillion here, trillion there. Across most annual reports, anything under a million is just a, is just a rounding error. Um, anyway, into the, into the nuts and bolts. So there are actually quite a lot of standards involved in financial instruments. And given how complex this area is, it's actually not surprising that's the case. Now, this is also one of those areas where you don't, I can be, we can talk about it here and there are going to be changes in the next few years. Like things are changing all the time in this, in this case. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So seven deals with just disclosures about what entities, reporting entities have to provide information to the market. Um, this is in terms of how these things are presented on the statements. And this is term, and 139 is on recognition and measurement. Now, ultimately what's happening is that 139 and 132 will get superseded completely. You, those will actually disappear. And what we're gonna end up with is just a full scale um, AASB 9 which is just financial instruments. Now, they, there are three phases in financial instruments the IASB is going through. They've done the first one, which is to actually deal with most of this. They're currently going through impairments on financial instruments, and we're gonna talk about a little about that later on this afternoon or tonight. And some of what they're leaving for the moment is hedging. So there's a, there's a lot of projects left to go in terms of rolling this through. Fair value measurement, we're not going to talk too specifically about it today, but what's happened is there are a lot of fair value measurements in financial instruments and in other areas as well. So if you think of property, plant, and equipment, intangibles, in leasing, which we haven't got to yet, um, there are fair value measurements, even agriculture. And what they're doing is saying, instead of having to worry about a definition in each of those standards, let's just have, this is where we talk about fair value measurement and all those standards will refer to that central idea of fair value measurement. And that has been somewhat controversial with some of how they define things. But ignoring the controversy, let's just look at what the core ideas of financial instruments. And a financial instrument is any contract that gives rise to both an asset, a financial asset and financial, financial asset of one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument of another entity. So if I have a contract with Anthony that I have borrowed money from him and we have a contractual arrangement in place. I've borrowed money so I have a contractual obligation to pay him money. He has a contractual right to receive a financial asset because I am going to be giving him cash. That is a financial instrument, that loan. Um, so that's a fairly straightforward financial instrument but that's what we're talking about. So it's important though that there is a contract that is sitting there. Um, so financial assets, there's a lot of text on here and look, you can kind of understand when there's lots of, as I said, really clever people working out on all these sort of things, there's a lot of nuance and there's a lot of detail in there. So a financial asset is basically one of three things. Financial asset is cash. So if you've got cash, that's a financial asset. If you have an equity instrument in another entity, so I have shares in BHP. If I had a balance sheet and if I was a reporting entity, that BHP share or those BHP shares on my books would be a financial asset for me. And, another, and, the, and the third set, and we can kind of roll all of this together and we'll talk about some of the details later on, is, a contract, is in essence a contractual right to receive cash or to receive an equity instrument or sorry, another financial asset. So it's cash, it's an equity instrument, or it's a contractual, contractual right to receive cash or another financial asset. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the others a little bit later on. Financial liabilities, we just talked, I had a financial liability to Anthony because I owed him money. It's a contractual obligation again, and to deliver cash is in that idea. So I owe him money, I have to have a right, not have a right, I have an obligation to pay him. There we go. Um, uh, 
we'll talk a little bit about this as we go through the practical examples. Um, or if it's a contract that will be settled in your own equity instruments. So if you have a contract and you will, I suppose if you think, it's, think about share-based payments, you have a contractual right to pay them some sort of equity arrangement, then that would fall under this idea as well. Some really basic ones, receivables, payables, ordinary shares, that's not really the focus of today. You've probably done that in first year accounting. We've probably touched on some of these things as we go through, but a lot of the accounting is more around, that we need to have a look at, is more around things like options and futures, uh, convertible instruments, things which are a little bit more complex. Now, the idea of them is a little bit more complex, but again, once we start to get underneath and figure out what's happening, they're not too bad. <sighs> Classification. Now, by now, I'm pretty sure everyone in the room should be pretty comfortable with this. You should have a fairly good idea if a company had issued some sort of financial instrument, whether they'd prefer to call it debt or equity. You should have some idea because you should have it, know how it impacts the balance sheet. You'll know how that impacts financial ratios. You know how there are management contracts tied up with it. There might be debt contracts tied up with it. There might be remuneration tied up with it. You should be fairly comfortable that management will prefer to show things as equity rather than liabilities. Um, but for some instruments like ordinary shares, that's pretty easy. I mean, an equity instrument has no contractual obligation to provide anything. Um, so if I have BHP shares, which I do, BHP does not have to pay a dividend from a contractual point of view. From a financial point of view, financial point of view, if they stop their dividend or cut their dividend, that's gonna have a massively negative imp impact on their share price. So they are somewhat forced to keep paying them. Companies don't like to cut their dividends, but contractually, they're not obliged to do that. However, when you come to some types of instruments, preference shares, for example, preference shares from a legal point of view are equity. Like they're, they're deemed to be equity in the way that they're set up. However, they may be set up with situations that they have, they have to provide dividends, that, they, that these things will be provided as part of a contractual right. And it starts to become a lot trickier to figure out, okay, is it a debt or is it equity? And that's where looking at the substance of the agreement, the actual economic form of it, is really important. Uh, convertible notes are one of those things. We won't, you need to have a look at convertible notes when you get to them, but we need to figure out with convertible notes. And all that they are is something which, when you issue them, they're liability. But they give the person who gets it off you. So I'm just going to keep using, actually, no, I'll use you. you, you I haven't used you yet. So what's your... Chris, okay, so I need to borrow some money and instead of just borrowing through a normal loan, I borrow money, money, uh, I borrow money off Chris, so I borrow $100,000 off him. Now at the end of that, end of the one year, the term of the loan, or the term of, of the bond, I just go, okay, in the arrangement is, you can either get your $100,000 back or if you choose, you can take X number of, you can take X number of shares in my company. So he then has the option to convert that debt he can, either he can either get cash back or he can say, I actually think I want to have shares in your business. I will take that as shares. Now, that means when we've set this up, the instrument actually has a liability component and it has an equity component. And the question then is, should we show the entire thing as a liability at the start? Should we show and then roll it into equity later on? Should we split it up as liability and equity? Should we just show it all as equity? Um, do we figure out what he's in likely to do and then make that determination or should we just leave it till the end? Um, so those are things to consider with this and some of the, some of the questions you're going to be doing um, do look at convertible notes and it is useful to have a look at how they work. We're just going to work, look at a straight, a straight debt instrument when we get to the example today, um, but some of the tutorial work looks at a, looks at a hybrid situation.